Good morning, everybody in the lecture hall. Good morning, everybody on Zoom. Good morning, everybody from the future. Uh, today, we will finish this, the relational algebra part. That was a theoretical part. And then we'll move on to a practical part. I told you that I'm alternating between the two. Before we start, I'd like to ask you a few questions. So I have this ready right there. So here are three SQL comments. Um, which one of the following is not a DDL comment? Is it the create table comment or statement? Is it alter table, insert into, or drop table? Three of these are DDLs. One of them is the ML. What does DDL stand for? Yes, exactly. And the ML? Yes? Exactly. Definition, manipulation. I'm looking at your answers. Oh, what do we have? There is a majority here. And I will not let you, I will not keep you waiting for longer. This is correct, indeed. DDL is really everything related to the schema. You define the tables, you define the columns, the types of the columns, the consistency constraints, and so on and so on. But everything that's related to the data, the content of the table, inserting or querying the data in there, that would be DML. All right. Let's move on to another question then. which is right here. I'm giving you four tuples and one schema definition, a create table statement that defines the schema for a table. This is SQL. And I'm asking you which one of these tuples, records, rows, whatever you call them, maps, satisfies the constraints implied by this schema, right? So create table, my table. I'm trying to fit it all on the screen like this. So A, char three, B, numeric five, C, date, D, boolean. And these are the four tuples. There's not really a common notation for the maps, right? So here I just use this uh, double a row, like the equal greater than. That's just my way of saying that we map um, uh, an attributes to, uh, to a value, right? And I'm just listing them. One of these matches the schema. The other three, if you try to insert them, of course, you would have to write the, the insert into statements in SQL. You would get an error for the other three. Let's see what you say. Aha. Uh -huh. There's a majority for the third one. And we have one person for the last one. You can still change your mind. The majority is not always correct. Uh -huh. Ah, now we have three people, four people for the last one. Okay, I think it converges. All right, well, guess what? It's the last answer that was correct. Uh, so let's go through this. Um, so the first one, uh, what was the problem? So A is mapped to a string with four characters, right? So this is why this one doesn't fit. The second one, it has three characters, so that's fine. Uh, but then we have this E mapped to false, right? And that's not okay because E is not part of the schema. So in the beautiful world of relational tables, we cannot have attributes that are not part of the schema. Uh, the third one is uh, incorrect because of the numeric, because if you say numeric with just a, a, a precision, it's an integer. It cannot be a decimal. For accepting decimals, you would need a second number that gives you the uh, the number of, uh, so the scale, the number of decimals after the decimal point, right? And the last one is correct. And it doesn't matter that D and C 
are uh, topsy turvy because this is uh, this doesn't matter. It's a map, right? So the order in which I'm mapping the attributes to the values doesn't matter. All right. So this is why the last one is correct. So now I'm going to move back to the slice and we'll continue. This is the one I think. There you go. So I was in the middle of doing math with you, all the math to manipulate relational tables as if there were numbers, right? It's like a data calculator, right, that we have here. We put tables in and we get tables out. So this is the big menu of everything we had, and I, I'm done with a lot of them, but not all of them. So I still need to continue. I was with the Cartesian product, right? And the Cartesian product, remember, it's the idea that of creating pairs of records from the left and from the right. But once you've computed it, you no longer have the separation between what comes from the left and the right, right? Then you merge the, uh, the records together. So uh, you had a table with two rows and three columns, another one with three rows and two columns. And then you get a table with six rows. It's the products two times three, right? Six combinations and five columns, all of them, right? For whom is that clear? All right. I gave that to you with a warning. Be careful. If you have very large tables on the left, you might crash your machine, right? So be careful with this. Um, be careful also with the names, because if you have, for example, in that case, B on the left and B on the right, then you kind of have a problem if you try to merge the maps, right? That, that doesn't work. So it's best to rename uh, uh, the, the colliding attribute. So here I added this row. You remember row is for renaming. So I rename B to E on the side of S and then that's fine. Then I can have the Cartesian product, right? All right. Uh, technically, you will find in textbooks that uh, they still do the Cartesian product if they are colliding attributes. In fact, even PostgreSQL will do this. And what actually is done in that case is that they just rename the, the columns arbitrarily. One way of renaming them is to put the name of the relation with a dot like r.b and s.b. It's a way to disambiguate them. Another way is to, if, you, if it's called b, then you just have b and b2, right? So there's plenty of ways. I don't really like that because mathematically, that's a bit, it's a bit arbitrary, right? Mathematically, it's not very nice. So please don't do that and just try to, you know, uh, rename or make sure that when you do the Cartesian product, you just have distinct uh, column names on both sides. Then you don't have the problem of having to rename columns. All right, so that's the Cartesian product. Then we move on to the join. This one is a bit less dangerous, still a bit expensive, but uh, if it's done with primary keys and foreign keys, because actually that's the goal, right? We want to take a table that has a primary key, another table that has a foreign key pointing to the first one. Who remembers primary keys, foreign keys, right? It's for the table of people and the table of tax returns, and then you, you use the, uh, the uh, social security number to point to them. Well, typically, imagine that B is your social security number. So imagine that table S is the table of people, B is the primary key somehow, associated with D that could be the address, for example, or the name of the person. And then in table R, B is the foreign key. So A might be the tax return together with C and B is the social security number. And you want to kind of bring them together, right? You want to match a person with a, a, a tax return. So what you do is that it's a bit like the Cartesian product. It kind of starts the same. So that I'm not done here. I'm just showing how it's done. That's not final on the right. But the first thing you do is that you kind of build the Cartesian products uh, with these temporary column names to just show you there's RB and SB. But then what you do, uh, because it's a join, you will only keep those records for which the two match, right? So you only keep the, the ones that are marked in green here that are highlighted, right? These, these are the only two you keep. Why? Because here, the B coming from the left is one and coming from the right is also one. We keep them. Here it's two and two. We keep them. Here we don't keep. One, two, it doesn't match, right? So the idea is really, imagine we have this tax return. We match it with that person. We have this tax return. We match it with this person. So in fact, what we have in the end is just this, right? And by the way, we won't keep the two columns. Why, why would we keep them, right? It's the same value. So this is what is on it. Now that's final. That is my join. 
right? So here I joined the table with my tax returns uh, with the table with the persons, right? And that's what I get. For whom is that clear? Right? You really match them together and you match the records of R and S for which the value of B is the same. Why B? Because you just look for the columns that are on both sides. And in that case, the column that is on both sides, that's B, right? It's called the natural join when you do that. You just use whatever columns are on both sides. Of course, if there are several columns on both sides, then you just match all of them, right? If there's A and B, for example, then A and B must always be equal on both sides, right? I just give you an example with just one. That's called a natural join. And it's this symbol here that's like the Cartesian product, but you add this small, these two vertical bars, a bit like the infinity sign, but uh, with straight lines. Okay, now you need to be a bit careful. And uh, because if, you, if, if, you, if you're not careful, something could break mathematically. Like for example, if you have tables and the domains of the two columns that have the same name are not the same, that's kind of not going to work, right? Well, technically it would, but it would be empty because a Boolean is never going to be equal to an integer, right? Um, mathematically, it's not the same. You could, of course, canonically identify zero with false, but uh, in, in general, uh, it's not the same, right? So technically, if you try to do a join between these two, it would be empty because you would never match any integer with any Boolean. But the shorter answer is just don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Just do the joins when you really, really have the same types and so on, which if you have a primary key and a foreign key is the case anyway, right? Because we, if you have a foreign key, you will take over the same type as the primary key, obviously. All right, so that's just for the corner case that you're aware of that. And uh, if you have no common attributes, that's, yes, go ahead. The same value. Uh, let me show you directly on the slide. Uh, everything. So let me show in the case of B. Here it's the case that we only have B on both sides, right? And when I say it has to be the same, I mean that the value coming from the left must be the same as the value coming from the right, here and here. These would not be part of the join because they don't have the same but I can show it directly here. It really means that the one right here, you associate with this one right there and not with this or with this. They are irrelevant. These are other people, right? And the two here is only associated with the two here and not with this one and not with this one, right? Uh, and what I was saying is that it might be that there's more than one common in common one column in common, but in that case, imagine that you have columns A and B, and here you also have, imagine that we call that A here instead of D. Imagine it's A. Then we would, we would match foo one with foo one, right? And bar two with bar two. But if it had been foo two, that wouldn't be matching, right? So if you have multiple columns in common, then the values must, ma must match for all columns together. It makes sense, right? Because the primary key is all the columns together that identify a record, right? Imagine that you have countries and zip codes. You need the country plus the zip code, right? You're not going to match two addresses with the same zip code if it's a different country, right? So th this is exactly the idea here, okay? Does it make sense? Yeah, all right, go ahead. You have another question? Mm -hmm. So you're asking, I'm repeating because we, we, you didn't have the microphone. Uh, what happens if what we want to join here is a different name, is your question, right? What happens if I for a key has a different name? I have slides for that. I just show you a, a sneak peek of that. That's how it's done, right? We have what's called the theta join. And so what you do is that you add this little subscript here that specifies now we want to match A with D. That's how it's done. All right? Any other questions? No? Okay. So let me just, I think I was done actually here. Uh, oh, no, I was saying that's yet another corner case. In practice, you shouldn't be doing that, but it's just for the sake of the math, because in math, we like to also consider vector spaces with zero dimensions and, you know, empty set kind of things. 
Um, so in the case that you wouldn't have any common attributes, if you're a mathematician, I'm going to try to think as a mathematician. I told you that you need to put the records together if the values for all attributes in common match. That's called the universal quanti quantifier in mathematics. For all attributes that are in common, it must match. Now we have zero attributes. That's called the universal quantification on the empty set. For all attributes in the empty set, because they are not in common, something must be satisfied. And the mathematicians have that rule. It actually makes a lot of sense that when you have a universal quantifier on the empty set, it's just always true, right? Uh, so for example, if I told you uh, that uh, I don't know, uh, um, for all the clouds uh, in the sky that are purple, you have cows that come down from them instead of, uh, of water, right? It's actually true because you, you, there are no purple, uh, purple clouds in the sky, right? So I'm basically saying a for all on something that doesn't exist or something that is empty. So here, if I'm requiring that all attributes must have the same values in the records, there are no attributes at all. So it will, it's always true. So technically, if you try to do a join and there's no attributes in common, it gives you the full Cartesian product because it's always true. Who understood that? Okay, it doesn't really matter if you don't because that's such a corner case that you shouldn't even be doing that, right? But I'm just giving you the spirit of the fact that technically it would uh, always be defined. And if you want to feel safe, you can also just forbid it. And say, okay, we don't allow a natural join if there are no attributes in common. Okay, now the theta join to come to your question. <laughs> Excuse me. So, there you go. So now, what if you have no attributes in common, but you still have a primary key and a foreign key that are defined and you still want to jump them together? So here I'm assuming that D is my primary key for the relation S and A is my foreign key for relation R, right? So now I'm going to still be able to join them, but I need to explicitly say my intention. My intention is to do a join based on A equals D. And what I will get is a table T with all these columns. And now we will not retain all of them. If you look at it, there's only these two here. That's, yeah, these three. Oh, there's three actually. Why three? What did I do here? Oh no, yes, there are three. Yeah, yeah, I was looking at B, that's why, just because of the formula. We are looking at A and D. So now, what do we match? Foo with foo and foo and bar with bar, that's three of them, which makes me notice a mistake. That would be the primary key that would be a foreign key. Why? Because it's duplicates, right? If you have duplicates, it can't be a primary key, it has to be the foreign key. So that would be the foreign key here. This is pointing to here, this is pointing to here, and this is pointing to here, right? So I basically keep the, these three tuples that are marked here, you see, uh, foo and foo, foo and foo, bar and bar. Here it doesn't match, bar foo, here it doesn't match, foo bar. Here it doesn't match. So I just keep this, and that's the result. That is my theta join between R and S, given the predicate A equals D. For whom is that clear? All right, perfect. Note that to make you understand, I talk about primary key, foreign key, but technically there's no restriction about that. You could technically join whatever you want. It doesn't even need to be foreign key, primary key. But most of the time it will be. Uh, especially in the exercises in the exam, very often when you do joins, it's because we have uh, we have keys, uh, foreign keys and primary keys. All right, now it turns out that the theta join is not a primitive operator. What do I mean with this? I mean that if we didn't have that operator, we would, we would still be able to do it with the others. So let's try to express this. Now we do real math, right? So let's express this with other operators. And actually, I can do it in this way. I can take the Cartesian product followed by a selection with the same predicate. Who agrees with that? It's pretty much what we've been doing here, right? If I show you again the slides, I started with a Cartesian product, right? And then I selected based on the criteria, yes? Oh, that's because in that case, it's not a natural join. So these two columns, uh, they, they, they still have a life of their own, right? But really it's a, just a convention because you could also instead define it by just merging the two columns. 
the problem is that mathematically you would have to make up your mind do you pick b or do you pick e right so in a way it's more symmetric mathematically to just keep the two but after that you could make a projection right you could add a pi a b c d and then uh, put it away right but in the case of the natural join we do eliminate them because it's the same name right or otherwise you would have an inconsistency if you have two columns that would have the same name that's the real reason yeah yes uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, duplicates in A and duplicates in B, then you just match all the combinations. So if you have, for example, three tuples that are foo here, two tuples that are bar here, then you have six records on the other side, right? All the matches, everything that matches is put together, all the combinations, okay? And that can happen, actually. If you do something, it's not a primary key, that can absolutely happen. Okay, very good question. I mean, everybody's asking very good questions. It uh, means you're following. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, uh, yes, so who now understands that this is the same? Right? Okay. So technically, there's this notion of primitive operator and, and uh, those that you can derive from the others. There's another one. Turns out that the intersection can be expressed with the subtraction operator. And this is how. Technically, you can say that what's in the intersection of R and S is technically what is in R, but only if it's not in R minus S, right? So basically, if you have R intersection S, if you start computing R minus S, then you select the part of R that is not in S, and the intersection is just the complement of that in R. Who agrees with that? Maybe you can do a drawing to convince yourself, right? So the idea is that you can partition R. Let, let's put it that way. Imagine that you partition R in two parts, the part that is also in S and the part that is not in S, these two parts. And basically what you're saying is that the part that is the intersection is R minus, minus the other part, minus the part that is not in S. That's pretty much what it says, okay? Did it help? A little bit? Okay. So it's just a theorem, like uh, we can call them mini theorems. Uh, the same for the natural join. You could technically write it in this way. It's a bit like cooking. So this is not a generic formula. I need to know the attribute names, but I can do the Cartesian product. Then I have to rename, assuming that I'm joining on A. A and A are on both sides. I rename A to A2 here. Then I do a selection on A equals A2, and then I project back, if I know, I'm assuming that I know that I have A, B, and C, right? I had A and B on one side and A and C on the other side, right? So it feels a bit like a hack here, but the reason it feels like this is only because here I need to know the names of my attributes to write something like that, whereas in the first case, I don't need to know them. For whom does that make sense, right? That I can write the join like that? It's really just I rename, in fact, this is kind of what we did in, in, the, in the slides. We did rename them to r.s and r.s. r.b and s.b, right? So we kind of did that, right? We, we, we renamed the columns, then we did the Cartesian product, then we selected based on the equality, and then we projected back to uh, a, b, c, d. Okay? All right. So these are kind of theorems, and you can just go ahead and write things like this, and you can try to show them. And actually, you can derive plenty of them. I'm just going to you know, throw them at you, but this is the sort of thing that you can do, right? You can just have these theorems like this. For example, th there are easy ones, right? The fact that selections commute with each other is kind of intuitive, right? Because if you select and select, it's like an end between the two predicates. Um, projections commute with one another. Here, you have to be careful mathematically because this is assuming that if you project on an attribute that doesn't exist, it's just ignored, right? So if you assume that, then you will realize that projections commute with one another. Um, then join union intersection are commutative. That should be intuitive, right? For whom is that intuitive, that union intersection join commutative? You can swap them. Doesn't matter what order you take them. 
Associative means that if you have three of them, you can start with two and then the third one, or start with the other two and then the, the first one. So that's associative. Distribution over union, it's the same as when I say multiplication distributes over the addition, right? If I say that C times A plus B, that's the same as C times A plus C times B, right? That's called distributivity of multiplication over addition. Turns out that I can also do that with the projection over the union, but not intersection and subtraction. You can have fun trying to find counter examples. Um, selection distributes over union. It means that the selection of the union is the same as the union of the selections. Um, joins distribute over union and uh, projection is absorbed by a projection on a smaller subset, right? So if you project on ABC and then on AB and then on A, it's the same as projecting on A directly. Right? Who agrees with that? Right. Just keep remo It's like deleting columns in Excel. You delete, delete, delete. It's the same as selecting all of them in one go and deleting them. Right. Okay. So I leave that. I, I think the TAs probably have some exercises regarding this. So you can try to prove uh, all of these statements. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, it just makes you familiar with, uh, with this. So you see, it's really like math, right? The same I can do with addition, multiplication, and so on. I can also do it with the relational algebra. Right, so it's actually pretty cool. All right. Now, what I haven't done yet, so I've done the set operations, so union, intersection, subtraction, selection, projection, Cartesian products, uh, joins, theta joins, so that I have all done. Um, what I have not done yet is grouping and sorting. Grouping, let's do grouping. Grouping is... In fact, it's super popular because this is pretty much what people want to do when they have a lot of data, right? Imagine you're the statistics office of, uh, of the Confederation or the Canton of Zurich, and then you have like uh, records of people and millions and millions of people, and you want co to compute things like the unemployment rates, uh, the number of people in each uh, Gemeinde, and so on. This is typically what you do with grouping. So the idea is that you start with your tables with millions of records, and then you notice that one of the columns here often have the same values, right? Foo, bar, foo, bar. There's only three values, actually, but they, they just repeat. And you might have on, in another column, let's say, some counts, right? So imagine, just to give you an example, imagine that I would have in Switzerland uh, a table of the population for each Gemeinde, each town. I have how many people are in there, and I also have the canton for the Gemeinde. And I want to compute out of that the population of every canton. So imagine that my canton is the first column. That's Zurich, Bern, Graubünden, uh, Jura, and so on. And then on the right, I have the counts for the villages, but the village, I just removed it in that case, right? It would be a third column that has the village. And so what I should do is that group together what belongs together. For example, everything uh, that, that is... Uh, 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 that is, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, interlaken, uh, foo, 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 that's interlaken. These are the, 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 the first, and then another one in Canton Bern, maybe the, the city of Bern itself. I want to add them, right? But first, I put them together visually, just to explain to you. Then I have bar, 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 bar. These are all the ones that came from, uh, that, that came from the left with the value bar, and then the two with foo bar. This is only a visual here because, as we as we know, it's uh, it's set semantics, right? So there's no order. So I just reorganize them to put them together. What's going to happen is that then I merge them and aggregate them. In that case, with a sum. So you have food that is 69. It's because it's 19 plus 4 plus 46. Bar is 677. That's because it's 28 plus 265 plus 245 plus 139. Right? It's just the sum. For whom is that clear? It's like per canton, I add the inhabitants of each town in the canton, and that gives me the population of the canton. This is a group by. This is a grouping query. Extremely popular in data analytics. Extremely powerful. Uh, everything in the middle is only to explain, right? The result of the group by is really the one concretely to the right, and my original table is, was on the left. Okay, now what kind of aggregations can I do? Here I did a sum, right? But there's others. For example, imagine that I have in one group, I have all of these values, just as an example. I could compute the count. That's one way. I want to know, for example, the number of towns in every canton. Then I do counts of this. In that case, these are 11 numbers in that case, right? Or I can do the sum, 55, right? You know how to do the sum of consecutive integers, right? 10 times 11 divided by two. Um, 
then you have average. The average of all of these values in that case is five. Then you have the mean, the mean would be zero. You have the max. For example, you would like to know the smallest town in every canton or the largest town in every canton, that's the max. Mode, what is mode? Mode is the most frequent value. So here I tweaked it a little bit. So seven appears twice, the others appear just once. So we say that the mode is seven, right? In a way, this is all coming from statistics, right? Who took a statistics lecture? Some of you? So in, in a way, you can just put in there whatever you take from the statistics, right? You can, you can just group in buckets and then compute these things. The variance is also a possibility. I'm not even sure if I actually computed that or if I just put a random number in there. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, okay. So that's all coming from the statistics lecture. Now, if I want to be more precise, what do you require? Because you cannot do that with any type. So if you compute the sum of the average or the average or the variance, you're assuming things. The first thing you're assuming in that case, these are numbers, and there is uh, uh, an addition uh, over that. Can I actually, I think it's slightly uh, losing battery. Maybe I'm gonna run out of battery on this one sometime soon. Yeah, there it works. Uh, so I assume that I have uh, numbers and I can add them and subtract them and maybe even divide, right? If I if I want the ability to compute an average, right? Then min and max, I don't actually need addition for that. Min and max, the only thing I need is comparison, right? All I, all I need is that. So you could actually use min and max with dates, for example. You cannot add dates, right? But you can still compute the mean of dates or the max of dates, right? It's just the earliest or the, the latest dates. And then mode. Uh, only requires uh, equality. Mode, you can do on pretty much anything as long as you can compare for equality because you're just looking for the label that is the, uh, the, 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 the most often present in there. All right. Okay. So we can group based on all of that. And now I'm going to giving you the magical formula because I told you that uh, we have these Greek letters, right? Sigma for selection, pi for projection, rho for renaming, uh, the join with this kind of uh, 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 Mobius band uh, with straight lines, and so on and so on. Well, guess what? We have one for grouping as well, and that's the gamma letter. Do you see the gamma in there? It's actually quite small on the left, but it's here. And gamma means grouping. Right. So I have the gamma right there, here. So here, I'm going to take that table right here. And what do I want to do? I want to group on countries and cities. This is what I want to group on. So, oh, these two are together, these two here. These two are together, Berlin, Germany, and Frankfurt, Germany, right? So I have three groups. What do I do for every group? I compute the sum of the price. So I, this plus this goes here. This plus this goes here and this plus nothing goes here right then i have a count here i compute a count so it's two of them here a count here i'm not adding right otherwise it would be five but since it's the count it's two there are two uh, records here and this is the count of one who understands this all right this is a grouping so how does it work just so because you you cannot put anything in there you have to be careful so you need to put some of the columns on their own country city. It means that these are the grouping keys. This is what you group on. And for the rest, you need an aggregation function, sum or count of a column. And then this little row, what is there after that is the new name. You just rename it. So you need to provide a name for the aggregation. So we see that we aggregate the price, summing them into volume, and we aggregate the customers, counting them into num transactions, right? And this is what I get. What you need to be careful about is to not mix things. You need to be, be careful here. For example, when you have the, the, the keys country and city, then you should not aggregate on them. Either you group or you aggregate, right? But you cannot both group and aggregate on the same column. So if you have country, city, and then some country or count country, that wouldn't be okay. You shouldn't be doing that, right? So you really need to distinguish between the columns that you group on and the columns that you aggregate. And there might also be columns that you just ignore and just leave out, 
Right. So either you group or you aggregate or you leave it out. In that case, I don't leave any out, but I have two that I group on and two that I aggregate on. Okay. That's the intuition. Technically, the math would still work if you actually put a column both as a grouping key and an aggregation, but don't because it's not really meaningful to actually do this. It would only create confusion. Right. For whom is that clear? Okay. And with SQL, it would be even clearer because we can do this with SQL as we will see. Okay, so that's kind of what grouping does. Okay, now everything that I've presented to you so far is based on the set semantics. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I think probably yes. So I, that that was just an example. I just threw statistics function in there. But absolutely yes. I, I, if you reach into uh, inconsistencies because of the function that you're using and it doesn't make any sense, then of course you get uh, you get an error. Right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's technically it's a matter of convention, right? So if you're on the side of the relational algebra, that's an unsound formula. So it's just an error. But then when you write some software that actually implements it, then the designers of the software could be arbitrary. They, they can make arbitrary decisions, right? What is the most important is that to document it, that you write in the documentation, okay, this is what happens uh, if you use a formula in a way you shouldn't be using it, then this is what's going to come out of it, right? Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's very common to, to aggregate uh, by variance. It, I, I just throw in a few statistical functions in there. Really, the five, if you want to remember, just five, count, sum, average, mean, max. These are the five. Yes? Instead of two attributes. Within the group. Yeah, within the group. Yeah, always. So, for example, here the sum is only within each, within the yellow zone, within the green zone, within the blue zone, right? You never aggregate across uh, the groups, right? Okay, that, that's really what I, when I drew this here, I have to be maybe closer here. You see, this is really the idea. I, I did it visually. You're really group by group, like you aggregate this, then you aggregate this, then you aggregate this, right? There's no communication between them. You have ways of communicating, but it's called windowing. It's sliding window, tumbling window, but this is totally out of scope of that, uh, of that lecture. Okay? Uh, okay. Yes? Oh, you can absolutely. Then it's just going to put them together. Uh, can I find it again? Then it's just going to have two groups, a first group with Switzerland, then a second group with Germany. Yep, exactly. Except if you do a count on the city, for example, right? Okay. Uh, okay. Now, um, Bags, because everything I've done until now was the set semantics, but you might remember if you paid attention a few weeks ago that you can have sets of maps, bags of maps, lists of, lists of maps, right? So I just want to show you just quickly what it looks like with bags instead of sets. What's the difference between a bag and a set? In a bag, you can repeat records. I can have multiple times the same records, right? So that's a set of records. Now it's a bag of records. Right. So now I can I have duplicates. Where do I have duplicates? I have bar two false. It appears twice, right? It's a bag, so it's okay. Don't worry about that. That's an old notation that I removed. I just forget forgot to remove in here. That was just an old notation. But this is technically a bag of records because also foo bar for true. You see it's twice there. But if we have a map, a, a bag, that's totally fine. But the thing is now, if we want to make it work on bags as well, we need to redefine all of these uh, all of these operations, right? So for example, if I compute the union between R and S, and I take a specific record that is M times in R and N times in S, how many times will I have it, will, will I have it in the union? It's quite intuitive. If I do the union of these two bags. Exactly, yeah. It's like you have a bag of candies. You have two candies in one bag, one in the other bag. You merge the two bags, you have three candies. That's pretty much how it works, right? So the union, indeed, you're completely right. That's, if it appears, yes, M plus N, all right? Now, the intersection, um, what do you think?
Yes? So the smaller one, right? Exactly. That's the minimum of M and N. And now more difficult. That's the subtraction. I'm telling you directly in the interest of time. If you subtract R minus S, then it's M minus N, right? Technically M minus N. However, you need to account for the fact that N might be larger than M, right? And if that's the case, you're just down to zero. So this is why I have this max zero N minus N. It's only in order to account to, to bring it back to zero if I would have something negative, right? Okay, so that's what happens here. Now, the projection is quite straightforward. The projection of bags is just that you don't have to worry about duplicates. So in the case of sets, when you implement a projection on paper, you need to remember to remove duplicates. But here you don't, you just keep the duplicates, right? If it were a set semantics, they would go away. There would be only three records on the right. But since we have bag semantics and I keep them, now I have four, a bag of four records. Who agrees? Okay, that's because I allow duplicates here. All right, selection, nothing changes actually. A selection of bags, you just keep the records that match the, 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 the predicate and that's it, right? Renaming an attribute, that's also easy. There's nothing that changes. Uh, renaming the relation, there's nothing that changes. The Cartesian product, um, you just need to be careful that if you have multiple times the same tuples, for example, if you match a tuple that appears R times on the left and you match it with another tuple that appears S time on the right, then you must have the product of them. Why? Because you match all of the combinations. That's why, right? So it's kind of a mini Cartesian product for every tuple that you match. Right, so R times S in the Cartesian product. Okay, the same would go for the join that I'm not showing here. Duplicate elimination, this is new. Delta, I didn't, uh, I didn't show that to you. Delta is just eliminating the duplicates, right? So you kind of force yourself to be a set, but a set is a particular kind of bag, right? It's a set is just a bag when it turns out that everything is just once uh, in, the, in the bag, right? So you can use this delta to automatically eliminate duplicates. In fact, you can do it in SQL. You have a distinct keyword that allows you to do this sort of elimination. So again, just a reminder here, we can have sets of maps, bags of map, lists of maps, and the three can be found in practice. Set of maps is kind of the textbook one when you learn for the first time. In the exam, we usually, we are careful, we tell you, we assume set of maps, semantics, or something like that, just so, so that it's uh, safe, right? And sorting, I didn't tell you, but you're just sorting. If, if you have the list of maps, semantics, you can also sort. Uh, the, the records uh, based on some specific column. You've all done that in a spreadsheet, right? When you create the, 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 the data filter and then you click on a column, ascending, descending, it just reorders the rows, right? So you're familiar with it. Who already did that? Okay, many of you. Okay. And now, so there's going to be the break soon. I'm going to end by a few words because we're going to get to SQL and the implementation. Now, what do they do in practice, the engines like PostgreSQL? Is it set, bags, or list? The short answer is they all do lists. If you, lose a, if you use a, a relational database, it will have lists. You can sort the records and so on. So this is lists of maps. But I said it's the short answer because the slightly longer answer is it's kind of either bags or lists. Why am I saying that? The idea is that it's going to be lists in the sense that if you explicitly tell it to order the records, then you're gonna have the order if you do not explicitly specify an order of the records, expect them to just be shuffled around. The idea is that the engine, if you don't specify any order, they will assume that you don't care about the order. So it's gonna start optimizing things and it will reorder the toppers a bit like it wants, just whatever makes it the fastest. So this is why it's kind of between bags and lists. But as soon as you order, then this is going to be a list. And technically, the even longer answer is that it's kind of also set because as soon as you have a table with primary keys, then you anyway end up with a set of records, right? So uh, the tables that have a primary key will be set. But remember that we will see that there are the tables that you store that typically have a primary key, and then there's the tables you create on the fly, and these might not have a primary key, right? These might just uh, be maps or bags or lists, okay? All right, so I'm going to stop here for the break. I'm going to see you at 15 past 11, and we'll have a practical lecture again with SQL, and then you can play with the notebooks. All right, see you in 15 minutes.